Mr. Descartes said, I think, therefore, I am. But the Abhidhamma doesn't go along with that. There is no thinker behind the thoughts. There is no controller. There's nothing, there's no entity in charge. All there are just psychic processes arising, passing away with great rapidity. Secondly, philosophy in the West doesn't have to be true or correct. It can be speculative in nature. Whereas the Abhidhamma is based upon direct knowledge. Not just speculation, but understanding. And thirdly, compared to Western thought, Abhidhamma is unusual. It gives an ethical basis to our states of mind. Some states of mind are wholesome, some are unwholesome, some are beneficial, some are damaging. And so there is very clearly um, some form of ethics coming into this, which you generally don't find in the Western way of thinking. So Abhidhamma, I mean to summarize it, it's a form of samaditi, right understanding, if you want to connect it with the Noble Eightfold Path. We can say it is um, an explanation of right view or right understanding. Now, we've done a lot of kind of abstract talk. Let's take an example of the kind of analysis which can be conducted with the Abhidhamma. Well, it denies there's anything permanent, but it also says that just one mental state conditions another mental state, and that state conditions another mental state. So there isn't a kind of controller. There isn't a, a puppeteer who's pulling the strings to make the puppet move around. That's not there at all. There are just these states arising and passing away. They arise and pass away so rapidly that they give us the illusion of something permanent or lasting, some kind of entity that we talk about I. When we think of I, we have a concept of something enduring. If not eternal, at least it is enduring from the date of your birth up to the date of your death. But there is nothing which lasts for longer than a split second. We don't see that. We have wrong understanding and we misunderstand things. We don't accept or we don't understand that things are not as they appear to be. We see things through a fog of ignorance or non-understanding, uh, moha. Have you heard the term moha? Loba, dosa, moha. The three root defilements. Attachment, aversion, and ignorance. These are the fundamental negative qualities in the mind. 
which we are striving to eliminate. But as long as there is moha, it obscures our vision like a cloud obscures our vision of the sun. And because of this, we go off down wrong tracks, we make wrong decisions, we do silly things based upon the fact we don't really understand things correctly. Now, the way that the mind works is explained by this sheet, the five niyamas, the five um, explanations of the way things are. And you will see that chitta niyama is the explanation that the mind works according to certain um, principles or certain patterns which make the mind work the way it does. There are also four other niyamas which we call natural laws. The Buddha taught, I think, no, not the Buddha, the commentary teaches these as the way to explain the functioning of the world. We have the inorganic order, the Utu Niyama. We have the organic world, Bija Niyama. We have the law of cause and effect, Kamma Niyama. And we have, the, the other one is Dhamma Niyama certain doctrines like anatta fall into that category. So you can also use this to understand not everything happens due to karma. There are other things going on. So if we look at this process of thought. Just Everything is caused, but if you're saying it is determined in the sense of predetermined, that is the doctrine of predestination, which denies the value of individual effort and the possibility of reaching enlightenment. So I won't say it is um, predetermined, but Yes, everything has to arise due to a prior cause. And that cause depends in turn on its cause, and so on, and so on, and so on. And which is according to the law of nature. That is what Bija Niyama. There is also Utu Niyama. Explains things like the seasons. Why we have summer, why we have winter, why um, we're going to have rain tomorrow, but not the day after tomorrow. There are certain principles upon which meteorology is understood. So we can predict the weather, not always accurately, but we think we can predict the weather. Let us take the what we call the thought process. This is how we perceive things. When you see something and say, oh, this is a pen, what has happened? How have you been able to know that 
this is indeed a pen. Well, we know according to this process. Starting at the bottom, we have this word bavanga. This does not have an equivalent in Western thought. No, it's a it's a state of chitta, state of mind. Um, bhava and anger. Bhava means to become. Anger means a limb. We have bhava tanha, desire to become. We have a whole set of suttas in the anguttara nikaya. The, the limbs. So, if you want an English translation, the limb of becoming. Mm. Well, that's not very helpful. Mm. Limb, L-I-M-B. Oh, okay. mm. Yeah, the limb of becoming. Sometimes, life continuum. Mm. The bhavanga is not a solid entity. What I'm trying to say is that <coughs> all of these things are processes, not static, enduring things. So Bhavanga is like a river flowing on going on and on and on. It consists of individual moments which last for a split second and pass away and condition the next moment of bhavanga which lasts for a split second and passes away and so on. Bhavanga starts to flow at the moment of conception. And it will continue to flow until the moment of death. So the bhavanga is something of which we're not conscious. When the mind is in a state of sleep or a coma, that is where the bhavanga is flowing on uninterrupted. But in conscious thought, bhavanga is constantly interrupted when some kind of event happens which comes through one of our senses. But without that, bhavanga would flow on and on and on. Some people say it's an unconscious. There are two things which separate bhavanga from, or differentiate bhavanga, from how we normally think of an unconscious. The first is we think of unconscious as being always present. We may not be conscious of it, but it, it is always there. Bhavanga is not always present. It is interrupted when a conscious thought process takes place. And secondly, the subconscious or unconscious is often held to be able to influence our everyday conscious thought. That something in your subconscious makes you do something. Bhavanga doesn't have that power at all. Bhavanga is in a way what preserves individual identity. 
what makes you different from me. Because without that, you could just have a lot of unconnected thought processes floating around without any kind of sense of continuity. So I think that the Theravadans have a problem. How do you explain the continuity in one life if you are not going to allow some kind of permanent self? The answer is Bhavanga. These are different terms which are often used in the suttas and a little bit vague. So the Abhidhamma is defining things in its own terms which don't always have exact parallels in the suttas. If you take the word Vijnana. In Abhidhamma, that would be Chitta plus Chittasika. So we have this state of Bhavanga. It's a form of consciousness operating in one specific mode, a mode of which we are not conscious. And this process goes on and on and on. If you look at this chart, number one, past Vavanga. For the purpose of this chart, it's only showing one but there could well be dozens and dozens and dozens of past bhavanga. Then this process of thought or this process of cognition starts. This is concerned with the five uh, conventional or external senses. We call them doors. Eye, door, ear, door, nose, door, body, door, tongue, door. Now we're looking at number two. Something stimulates one of the sense doors. If you think of bhavanga as quietly flowing on like a river and then something like a, a branch of a tree falls into the river and sets up a vibration. Think about the spider sitting in his web, quiet, peaceful, and suddenly dong, 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 a fly has blundered into the web and set up a vibration. So now we have a vibrating state. And then this flow of bhavanga is arrested. It's brought to a halt. The analogy is that Bhavanga cannot be stopped immediately, just as a man who is running cannot stop immediately. He has to take one or two steps to bring himself to a halt. So, it's only at stage three that Bhavanga is brought to a halt. And then, 
a kind of consciousness arises through one of the sense doors. Dvara means a door, our vajjana turning to, turning to a sense door. So this is one of the doors, could be eye door, ear door, nose door, etc. Atita Bhavanga has been going on and on and on and on. And then something happens to set up a vibration through one of our sense doors. Well, there's another set of Bhavanga called vibrating Bhavanga. And then there's another set of Bhavanga called arresting. So are they sequential? Yes, all of these follow each other. So now we have what is called sense door consciousness. This means that one of our sense doors has been stimulated and we know is this the eye door, the ear door, the body door, or what? Then we get what is called sense or sense door consciousness. Pancha means five, vijnana consciousness. So it's one of the five kinds of consciousness. For consciousness to arise there has to be what we call contact. Contact between an external object or stimulus and its appropriate sense door. So if a sound strikes the ear door, that sets up ear consciousness or auditory consciousness. Up to this point, we have no idea what's going on, really. We just know that something has created a vibration. But now at least we know this is, this is hearing going on, or it's tasting going on, or touching going on. So consciousness arises only through this process of contact. In Western thought, we think more of the idea of consciousness as something that's there all the time, and then this consciousness undergoes certain experiences. That is not the Bhavanga and Abhidhamma explanation. Consciousness only arises when the Bhavanga state of consciousness is arrested and stopped, and then a particular kind of consciousness arises. Eye consciousness, ear consciousness, body consciousness. So this is a, a dynamic situation. There's nothing static here. So can these have so we are not conscious? Not yet. Well, there is consciousness, but at the moment we're not aware of what's going on exactly. We now know, or there is awareness, that one sense door has been stimulated. But more than that, no. So, so the next. So, so this This is all perception. Well, at least up to stage number eight. Ah, okay. So, in order for the object to be known better, we have to have one moment of receiving consciousness, which means that this is assimilation. Taking up the object... Uh, accepting it, 
now begins <coughs> a process of identification. At first we were just aware that there was ear consciousness. But now, by examining this sound, by receiving it, we are beginning to know a bit more. We haven't yet identified the sound as something in particular, but there is, first of all, receiving, and then the next one, number seven, investigation. Here, there is detailed investigation. And so far, this process is a passive process. We can't control it. As long as your senses are working okay, you cannot stop yourself from hearing something or tasting something. This is a passive event. But we reach at number eight a very critical and important moment. First of all, the object is identified. Now we know. I have heard a dog bark. I have heard someone speaking to me. And now we make a determination. What are we going to do about this? Now we are moving from a passive phase to an active phase. So far, this has been a result. Now, we have a moment of determination to determine how we are going to react to what it is we have just perceived. So, we can control what it is goes on from here. we can react, say, to a pleasant experience with liking it, with attachment, with the wish for it to go on. On the other hand, if it's something unpleasant, normally our reaction will be aversion. Take, for example, somebody who is speaking to you uh, insulting language, bad language, cursing you. At Votapanna, you decide, am I going to respond skillfully or unskillfully? Am I going to respond automatically by just hurling back words of abuse? Or am I going to say no? I'm going to respond with patience, goodwill, understanding, compassion, etc., etc., etc. So, Votapana is where we can change the course of history, going this way or that way. We're going to go down a skillful route or an unskillful route. So yes, that's right. We make this decision, and then, following on from that, there are these seven moments called Javana. <coughs> Javana. Again, no real English translation. Impulsion is 
uh, one um, translation, um, apperception, the literal word, the literal meaning is running. And here we are creating karma. We've shifted from resultants, which is the first half of the process, but now we've taken the initiative and we are creating for ourselves wholesome or unwholesome karma, depending upon what we decided to do at the votapanna stage. At the votapanna stage, the determination is made, <coughs> I'm going to respond in this way or that way. That's, um, that's my decision. And then the javana are carrying out that decision. These are the moments where kamma is created. The, the first moment is relatively weak and cannot last for long, so it will give its results in the next life. The um, last one is also weak and gives results in the next life. I'm sorry, the first one is so weak it gives results in this life. And it's the last one that gives results in the next life. The other Javana moments are stronger and can bring results in any subsequent life. And then we have the process of registration. The, the committal to memory of what we've just been doing in the Javana stages. Although Buddha Gosa and the Visuddhimagga says that often the process is too weak to go as far as the Tada Lambana, the registration. But in the classic explanation of things, that is, uh, it continues up to number 17, the Tada Lambana stage. <coughs> that is one process of cognition. After that, the mind relapses, the consciousness relapses into the bhavanga state, which will then continue flowing on, flowing on, flowing on, until another object stimulates a sense door. And this process is repeated. <coughs> so that is going on throughout our life. Bhavanga flows, Bhavanga is brought to a halt, a conscious experience takes place, that stops, Bhavanga starts again, that stops when another conscious thought process takes place, and so on, and so on. These processes take place so rapidly, we cannot see them, or identify them. Millions take place in a split second. That is why earlier on in the questions of King Melinda, um, Nagasena said that the Buddha had done a very wonderful thing, being able to look at the water and say, this is the river uh, Ganges, river Yamuna, or some other river. In the same way the Buddha here has been able to break down this thought process into 
its constituent parts. So this takes place so rapidly that we can't see it. Now, there are certain points we should bear in mind. One, this can only take place when there is an object for chitta or consciousness to arise. There must be an object, which means that there can't be any kind of chitta without an object. In Western thought, we may say, oh, we have pure consciousness. <laughs> That's not what we've got here. It has to be visual consciousness, auditory consciousness, gustatory, etc., etc. If you think of the analogy with fire, you cannot have pure fire. It must be wood fire, coal fire, oil fire. You've got to have an, an object associated with the fire. No such thing as fire without an object. Same way, there's no such thing as consciousness without an object. So that Stage seven or eight, or can it stop? No, it goes on. It goes on. All you can do uh, is determine whether it is a wholesome uh, or an unwholesome uh, reaction. Javana, Javana five, five or seven. At some stage, Javana, you, you can stop? No. No, no. You have a choice where it goes. You have a choice at number eight. Yeah. Determination. Mm. I have determined what I'm going to do or say in response to the object which I've just identified. Like very important. Well, unfortunately for most of us, it's not conscious. So if I shout words of abuse at you, the automatic reaction is to shout words of abuse back at me. That's instantaneous. But with a little training of the mind or the consciousness, we can take the initiative and stop the automatic reaction and steer things in a wholesome direction. Can you see that this Javana don't explain the seven from eight to fourteen? There's nothing about what's happening there. Well, I think it's a process which has to run on to allow the comic effects to be developed. But what's 9, 10, 11? Are the two kind of... No, the javanas are all, all the same kind of javana, but some are stronger and some are weaker. Like I said, the first and the last are both relatively weak. Consciousness operate at a macro macro level, on a macro time scale, because if this is happening every millisecond, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can't make a conscious decision at that time scale. So it seems like this is inevitable. But we slowly, as these build up, at a macro level, we can improve our reaction. For the next time. <laughs> well, so I think I think that's where two qualities become important. The first is manasikara, <coughs> which can be either yoniso or ayoniso. Um, mindful or skillful attention, or wise attention, and unwise attention, which also lead to sati or mindfulness. If we develop this quality of mindfulness, we can perceive things more accurately. And um, it's a little bit more complicated than this because 
some more thought moments have to arise before an object is known properly. Three more thought processes. But as we got to nine o'clock, <laughs> I shall have to ask you to restrain your impatience and enthusiasm until next week. So, to be continued.